It's officially summer at Read, Return, Repeat, and while school's out, we're in session with another new episode. How's your summer going, Sarah? Hey, you know what? It's good. I've been out enjoying nature and uh, doing some reading. I would ask you how yours is going, Daniel, but um, I feel like I should let our audience know, listening in, that uh, you dyed your hair. You're, it's bleached. Yeah, no. Uh, trying a new summer look. Uh, also, I'm just really hyped for the new Barbie movie that comes out in a couple weeks. I'm a big Ryan Gosling fan. Baby Goose. <laughs> okay, Malibu Dan. Hey, why don't you tell us about today's episode? The book for today takes place in Southern California, but instead of the sunny beaches of Malibu, it explores the back lots of Hollywood's golden age. Hold on, hold on. Before we get into the book, let's talk about today's topic. All right. I almost forgot. Our episode today is called Yeah, Siren Queen. Hey, yeah, we're going to talk about Category 8, a book featuring an LGBTQIA plus protagonist. And we're going to be interviewing author Mi Vo. Vo is the author of the novels Siren Queen and The Chosen and the Beautiful, as well as the acclaimed novellas where the tiger came down the mountain and the empress of salt and fortune. She's a Locus and Ignite Award finalist and the winner of the Crawford Award and the Hugo Award. Born in Illinois, she now lives on the shores of Lake Michigan, where she's joining us from today. Let's say hi to Nee. We are here with Nee Vo. Nee, thank you so much for joining it's us awesome today. It's awesome to meet you. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. This, is so, this looks like so much fun. Um, we all really, really enjoyed Siren Queen. Can you tell our listeners about the story? Okay, let's see. I actually, after a while, I finally did get this pitch down. So Siren Queen is the story of a Chinese American actress looking to make her star in a Hollywood runoff of Fairyland Rules. It has monsters, more monsters than you can st shake a stick at, a lot of movie history, a lot of movie lies, and um, some really, really fun scenes with uh, things that want to eat you but are pretty nice about it. How about that? <laughs> oh, that's really well like phrased. They made me say it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> nice little package there. Mm -hmm. I uh, I actually, I really enjoyed it. And I was actually in Los Angeles last week listening to the book and just like the magical mm -hmm. realism. Uh, I was at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, which is like on the back lot of Paramount. And they have all these like Hellenic statues of monsters and things. And like, I was like really cool listening to the book while being there. But um, I guess my question is, there's, the golden age of Hollywood is like really fascinating. What inspired you to have your story set there? And what do you think of the, about that era that's so appealing? Um, I can tell you that uh, for me, Star and Queen came from, well, I mean, it, it, I mean, for so many of us, it starts with a terrible, terrible crush on Marlena Dietrich, you know, and, <laughs> you know, you, you, you see a picture of this gorgeous woman from the uh, 1930s in a tuxedo and top hat and, you know, you're 14, you're like, I want to know more about whatever is going on with her. So it sort of like um, fell headlong into a, a hormonal teenage crush. And then the crush sort of extended to an entire place and decade. So that's where it starts for me. Um, where it became a novel was sometime, I think it was like 2017 or so. Uh, I stayed up too late on a call with my friend Grace and I'm like, Hey, have you ever noticed that between the terrible contracts of the 1930s Hollywood, it's a lot like fairyland. You have to give up your name. They'll steal and buy children. They'll change your face if they don't like it. Um, see Rita Hayworth. And uh, my friend Grace was super patient with me, right? And, and she doesn't say, could we talk about like anything else? And so I went on for about two, three, four hours. And by the end, I kind of had a novel. And about that was about the time when... Um, the main character of Siren Queen, Lily, who is uh, the aforesaid Chinese American actress trying to trying to make her way and not get eaten too badly. Uh, that's when Lily shows up. And I'm like, oh, cool. Nice to meet you. I guess I'll be with you for the next 80,000 words or so. Uh, and that's kind of how it went. I wrote Siren Queen for a uh, for a novel contest. Uh, it was rejected, but they left me. They did actually give me a personalized rejection, which said, uh, we usually we don't give detailed critique, but you largely know what you're doing, which is wrong. That's that's a complete lie. I have no idea what I'm doing, but it did make me think, oh, well, I mean, I guess this can go to an agent or something while I figure out what my next step is and kind of just rolled on from there. That's awesome. And, uh, 
you mentioned uh, Marlena Dietrich, and uh, I just had a question. Were there a lot of real life inspirations for the characters in the book? For example, Anime Wong, widely considered yes. to be the first Chinese American film star, or like yeah, Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, we were like Harvey Weinstein vibe from uh, some of them. Yeah. 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 Uh, Oberlin Wolf is Oberlin Wolf is every terrible man in power who's ever managed to hold it over someone else's head in oh, because he's having fun with it. And I don't know, maybe that's maybe that's just the deal with predators. You you do bad things because you're having fun and not because you need to or you think you need to or you say you need to. Um, Anime Wong was absolutely an inspiration for a great deal of Siren Queen. But the actual cognate to Anime Wong in this story is an actress who doesn't show up at all named Su Tong Lin, who um, Luli, the main character, takes as sort of a uh, professional inspiration. And also with a certain small degree of resentment because um, Su, Su Tong Lin, who came before her, was before her the only way to be an Asian American actress in Hollywood. And that's what everyone expected her to be. And Lily says, no, I, I don't want to be a maid. I don't want to be a dead love interest. I really don't want to be dockside color for some to, to, for uh, some random scene in Singapore. And so in a lot of ways, um, Luli is reacting to Su Tong Lin and reacting as well to Anna Mae Wong. Um, there are actresses who are a little bit closer to what Luli is and also to the actresses that come after her. Uh, one of them is uh, Melia Fong, her her, her, um, her her pseudonym, who was active in the 1940s. Uh, Harry Long, who is a gay, very well-known actor in Luli's world, who was acted as sort of a mentor and protector to her, is based on me wanting to give a much kinder fate to the uh, actor Ramon Navarro, who was MGM's uh, famous great first great Latin lover, one of the uh, Latin American actors who became extremely popular and very, very well known uh, in, in the 30s. Um, he had a sort of rather dark and unfortunate fate. And I, it's one of those things where you look at pictures of someone and you don't know them, but you know about their life. And it's a very, very strange place to be as you look at them and you have sympathy for them. And you, you wonder what they went through. And Harry Long is just me wanting better for that actor. Um, let's see. Uh, some of the things that come out, some of the horrible stuff that I came up with for Siren Queen specifically has a lot to do with just the studio's way of doing business. Uh, Rita Hayworth, for example, who was um, uh, persuaded, forced, bullied into changing her name and hiding her ethnicity, um, is is one of the is one of the other places it comes from. And uh, some of, and of course, there's Marlena Dietrich and the entire queer scene of Hollywood at the time. Uh, so it comes from that and uh, Marlena Dietrich's famous uh, sewing circle, if you guys are familiar with that one. I'm not no. familiar with a lot of old Hollywood stuff, oh, but that's sure, okay. Sure, sure. I still find it super interesting. So please tell us. <laughs> oh, uh, the sewing circle was just sort of a, it, it was sort of a club, a uh, club somewhat apocryphal, but we're pretty sure not at this point. The Sewing Circle was a club of les of uh, lesbian top-tier actresses, including, among others, Greta Garbo, Marlia Dietrich, a um, few other names which are slipping me because my brain's kind of mush at this point, and I'm sorry. But uh, but essentially, it was a social group. And uh, if, you, if you think about it, the idea of these... While these women maybe knew how to sew, that is not what they were getting to get or there to do every every few weeks. So it was kind of a joke for them and honestly a, a great giggle for me when I discovered it. Cool. Uh yeah. I mean, I the thing is is that I don't know a lot about old Hollywood. Like it's, you know, it's glitzy, it's glamoury, but it's um it's just fascinating every time I hear about it. And I really like that you added this whole layer of like magical realism because uh, it probably was like that. And, and the whole time that we were reading it, um, it was hard to tell if you were just describing something or <laughs> if it was like the whole, you know, the star or like the thing that was in the, the shadows. And it was so, but that added to the whole vibe of the novel. Um, mm -hmm. So it really, really just worked. And I found the whole thing just a wonderful thing to read. I, it's sorry, I'm gushing a little yeah. bit. No, I'm no, probably going to 
<laughs> reel it in. <laughs> no, no. I've no, I love a, hearing great oh. things about myself. I wouldn't <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> no, I've no, had Hollywood. Oh. Mm-hmm, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I've, I've had Hollywood Babylon at my desk, Kenneth Anger's book about the era um, for like a few months now. And I think I'm finally going to read it because of your book. Because I'm like, I need to find out the backstory here. So. It's, it is, it is nuts. It is, um, the, the history of Hollywood is, it's a history of lies, essentially. Like all storytellers are liars. And, you know, it's, and some of the best lies are the ones we make everyone believe until their history, right? And that's, probably kind of a cruel way to say it um I, I i i couldn't make it as a historian because this is what i do with it i'm like i feel like the story is better and the story is more fun and you know i i've been asked a few times both politely and less so you know so why didn't you just do this as a straight history i'm like because i have the attention span of like a four-day-old kitten man all right um it's i could i i have no cards and i have timelines and i'm like wouldn't it be kind of nice if 1934 just lasted like another 30 years, another, another 30 years? That'd be easier for me as a person. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, my, my agent says things like, you know, it's like you didn't work this hard to do what you don't want to do. And at this point, I, and, you know, I'm like, I've always hated working hard. This is perfect. And, you know, I've been, uh, I was, I was never really a litfic reader. I'm a fantasy writer. I'm a genre writer. And that's where I feel the most at home. And given the fact that some of the first stories uh, that I ever learned about uh, identity in America come from Hollywood, it's horribly psychical. And I'm like this horrible little comeuppance for a lot of stories. I'm like, see, this is what you produced. I am actually the monster that you did make by telling me all these stories. <laughs> the monster is real. Um, the monster's just... real and, you know, she has a cute <laughs> brown face, right? <laughs> um, okay, so Luli, let's talk about this for a second. And her, um, as a character, she's kind of morally gray, right? <laughs> and honestly, I'm not sure that she's really all that likable because she spends most of the book uh, manipulating others in order to gain fame And um, she ends up playing a lot of the same games that the predatory men play, but like she's matching them at their own game. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that this makes her kind of an unlikable character. Um, Do you think that she could have been as successful if she had been more likable? (laughs) No, No. absolutely not. No. Um, Luli is one of those creatures who will not challenge a rotten world, she'll just learn to be good at being in that rotten world. And that certainly has its problems. And if you can say anything good for Luli, it's the fact that she doesn't want to be a lonely monster. She will help people. She will help people up behind her. But the thing is to help people behind her, she has to get someplace. She has to get someplace first. Um, the question of Luli's likability comes up a surprising amount when uh, when when writers write to me, and it's kind of both. There are people asking me why can't Luli be more likable, and the other half of the, the the questions are often so so. Even if I'm not likable, I can still be here, and that's I think that's very important to talk about. Just in terms of you don't have to be likable. You don't have to be pretty. You don't have to be charming. You don't have to be friendly, but maybe you are not as much of a monster as the people around you. And if there's a salvation, maybe it's there that I'm not as bad. And, um, instead, uh, being good in some ways is a privilege. Being able to be Mm -hmm. virtuous is a privilege. And, uh, it's pretty hard to be virtuous when you're hungry all the time or when you're desperate or when you're afraid that, you're going to die. So you can do good later. You can do as much good as you can, even if it doesn't match up to a standard of being good or likable. And uh, what it comes down to being is that I've, I've largely found, and you know, I staked, I, I staked a, a, a publishing career on this. So what I found is it's more important to be understandable as, as a literary character, not, not as a person. It's more important to be understandable than it is to be likable people largely went along with Luli because they understood her. Not that they wanted to be friends with her. I do not want to be friends with Luli, but in all fairness, Luli doesn't want to be friends with me. And um, <laughs> she, she, I'm not sure she really wants to be friends with many people, except for the fact that like most of us, she needs friends. She's just uncomfortable with it and doesn't know how to do it. Well, that's a great segue into my next question, <laughs> because while um, 
you know, Luli has girlfriends in the book. I found that the more interesting relationships that she had were with the other people that were her friends, right? Or her sister, um, Luli and Harry, Luli and Greta. They they were like the positive forces in her life, if you want to go that far. I mean, because mm. I wouldn't say that they were like these wonderful, virtuous people all the time. <laughs> they all had their own problems, but like um, they did kind of keep her from going too far off the edge, if you, if I could go that far. Um, what do you think these friends, what did you intend for these friends to represent for her? Um, Luli needs friends. I'm looking back at what I just said. I'm like, yeah, Luli needs friends quite badly because there's a lot that Luli doesn't understand um, about being a person in a lot of ways. Her friends are, like they are for so many of us, her friends are possibilities. They are people who can give her an alternate path, more resources, other ways of being. Like uh, Harry Long specifically uh, is the one that came to mind when you were asking this question, because Harry Long shows Lily a way to be queer and also to have what she wants. Um, she was going to be doing it either way, but he showed her how he did it, and that's one of the very important. That's one of the most important things of being in a community where you can see people who have gone ahead of you, which is such an important place for marginalized people, for queer people, for everyone who has come ahead of me. What have they done? Are there, is there a path I can follow or is not our alteration I can make it? Or is it a path I don't want at all? And it is wonderful to have that decision and deeply alienating and lonely when you think you don't. Um, when it comes to the question of friendship, as we said before, Luli is not a friendly person. She's mean, she's mean, she's prickly, she's ambitious. And that's very hard for people to be friends with. And there, it feels like at some point, um, there's a point when everyone who is important to her has to make the decision, I am going to be this woman's friend. She's a little horrible, but we're going to be together and it's it's going to be pretty cool. And it's something that Lulu need, needs. And we're not going to get in the word, into the idea of whether Lulu deserves it, because deserve is a very, very fraught thing for everyone. But it's something she needs and she gets. And we should all be so lucky as to get the things we need. But, you know, I don't think it was a conscious choice. I never felt like it was a conscious <laughs> choice for Greta to be like, I'm going to be her friend despite all her awfulness. Greta was like, I'm just going to be your friend because that's what girls do. And like, we can be friendly. We don't have to be comp competitors the whole time. <laughs> I loved Greta. She was um, just such a wonderful character. So anyway, I don't know that, that I'm just making oh. that point. Greta oh, no, absolutely. was all in no matter what yes there that is also greta <laughs> greta is also a monster greta is not a human that that's part of right. it as well greta most of greta's decisions have to go with how much fish can i stuff in my face and can i go home yet well and that's a great segue into our next question so Daniel. You, you do play a lot with the <laughs> themes of monsters in the book um example Lily gains her fame through playing monsters and there are real life monsters in the book the men in power mostly they don't all seem to symbolize the same thing, though. For example, Greta is also a monster, but she, like you said, but she's also sweet and comforting. How did <laughs> Luli's per portrayal of a monster in films compare to the other monsters in the book? Okay, so I actually had to figure this out for myself very late one night. Well, I'm like, huh, does this novel have like a theme? And I'm like, no, I hate themes. Um, the decision I came to um, when at, at the very bottom of it for Siren Queen was a monster is something that does what it wants in spite of the world around it. Um, some monsters are much larger, some are much smaller. And uh, Luli herself, by virtue of being queer, by virtue of not being white, has been labeled a monster simply for existing. And where she really shines and where she succeeds is when she embraces that. When she, you know, there is something deeply unflattering about, about someone saying, hey, you know, you look like the great. You look like a great choice to be a mon to be the the monster of this of uh, the sci fi flick. It is not a compliment that they're paying her, but it essentially gives her the ability to make a lot of money, to get her name and her face out there, to become sort of an icon for a generation of uh, people who had no idea that they could be seen, right? And honestly, as much as the rubber tail does, that makes her a monster in the eyes of quite a few people. Um, 
Greta is a monster because you know she's uh, she's she's a Norwegian uh, uh, skogsret, um, skogsra. I think uh, I'm very bad pronouncing that word, but um, you know. And then you have Oberon Wolf, who is a monster. Maybe not necessarily because he's this dark thing that lives under the hills and uh, dev- and devours the stories of those around him, but because he is malicious and because this is the world he wants to create and to hell with anyone who gets in his way. And it's all monstrous. And um, when you accept a world of monsters, you start looking much more carefully at why you use that word, which I think is helpful. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, I really like how you have defined that as like the monsters doing. Yeah. That's what a- they Because we were all like, well, but Lu- uh, Greta's a monster. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, but she, she is. She's like, I don't care necessarily about all of this. I want what is important to me. Um, did you so think I she asked in that vein? Did, did you think she asked uh, Brant Hiller if he wanted to come be her husband? She did not. Yeah, ask she didn't. Yeah. No, I mean, luckily he he was willing to roll with that. But it was like, well, you are my husband now, and now we are going to go live in Sweden. <laughs> I hope you. Yeah. I hope you. I hope you like Sweden. It's gonna be cold, but I don't care much. You'll feel. <laughs> you'll be fine. You'll love it. <laughs> or even if you won't, you'll be with me, which is what I want. No, uh, Greta is very sweet and very loving. And I do want to be friends with, and I do very much want to be friends with Greta. But um, they are, oh, do, do you know, okay, you know, this is one of those things where I probably should have said something. I told you that she's a, a skogsra. Um, it's also, the, the word I know better was was huldra, which is... Um, they are Scandinavian wood nymphs, essentially, and okay. they're they're women with uh, with cow tails, or they have hollow backs. Uh, Greta's tail is actually amputated when we meet her, you know, because okay. that's that's what Hollywood does. Um, but they are uh, they're beautiful women, and they're they're dangerous. They're they're very dangerous. Sometimes they come into town and they they marry men, right? And they stay with them, and they're good wives and good mothers. And um, there, well, the story that has always struck with me about uh, where Greta comes from is at one point, um, story goes that a, a Huldra came out of the woods and married a man and uh, he struck her, which he had promised never to do. And she just looks at him and uh, she picks up the fireplace poker and for a moment he thinks he, she's going to be, beat him to death. And instead what she does is she bends the poker into a wet, into a um, into a ring as round as a wedding ring with absolutely no effort whatsoever. And then she just throws it away. And he realizes that this creature can just end him if she wants to. And that's his warning. And that's the only one he's ever going to get. And, you know, because the story is a story, it goes on to, and then they live together happily ever after. And the fact that uh, Greta doesn't actually, you know, she's bound and she's trapped, but Greta is something that can actually bend your spine into, into a wedding ring. So that's where Greta is coming from. I love that. Uh, yeah. We were we were wondering that too while we were mm-hmm. discussing this episode um, and our team. And so a couple members of our team were very excited to <laughs> to get this information because they were, they were wondering where Greta's story came from. Yeah, she's also Greta Garbo. So I mean, that's oh, that's oh, of it as well. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you know what? You know what? Greta Garbo's famous line is "I want to go home," and you could not like Greta Garbo was an amazing actress, a famous beauty. And as far as I can tell, reading the biographies I did about her, she really just wanted to go home. She wanted to do her job and she wanted to go home and be on her own and doing whatever little hobbies she was into at the time, which, you know, she was a deeply private person. She did not care for the the world of publicity that is Hollywood. Um, she did not feed on that in any way. She liked doing her movies, but that was about it. She wanted to go home and she missed the snow in, uh, in Sudermalm. And, uh, and that's part of where Greta comes from. She's like, ah, it's not fun. I want to go home. Wow. That's Did not know like, that yeah, about it. Didn't figure yeah, that thing about sad, that. But I think a <laughs> lot of- Greta, old, come on. Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. Didn't make the connection. Mm-hmm. Uh, but let's take a break real quick. Yeah, we'll, we'll... Um, and then when we come back, we're going to ask you some more questions uh, and dive in a little bit deeper. So- Excellent. Stay we'll tuned. Right back. Did you know that the Wichita Public Library offers a large selection of digital magazines for free? They are easy to access and are now available to you on the Libby app. You can download Libby from your phone or tablet's app store, 
sign in with your Wichita Public Library card and start browsing immediately. Magazines can be found under the Guide section on Libby and include popular magazine titles about news and politics, cooking, celebrity news, healthy living, and more. For additional information on Libby, please visit wichita.overdrive.com. All right, and we're back. Um, so uh, earlier we were talking about Greta and you're talking about how Hollywood kind of represents the fae or fairy realm or fairy world. And I just had a question, like you do have a lot of mythological uh, creatures in your book and like pull from a various different uh, pantheons. Are there any like pantheons of like mythological creatures that you like have you favor or that you like to pull from? Uh, so I was that kid at the library who was just like sort of hacking my way through the entire world mythology section. And uh, depending on the library, that went either really well for me or really poorly because it was like, oh, this is like one tiny book of, you know, Asian fairy tales. Thank you. That's all I get, I guess. Um, let's see. So um, Siren Queen is my first no is my first novel. And I don't know if I had it to do again, if I would actually choose to make it more centered rather than the sort of weird melting pot stew that it ends of mythology and, and, uh, and folklore it ends up being, but I kind of like the way it is. It's very much, it's a novel that's very much me and that I'm like, huh, I'm just going to throw it in and just see how well it washes. So of course, you know, we spoke about Greta, who is a Scandinavian monster. We have the, uh, the wild hunt, which hunts the uh, Friday night fires, which is very, um, uh, Northern Eastern Europe. Um, we also have the fact that the entire center section of Siren Queen, the the part two, is sort of uh, me doing a very loose retelling of the ballad of Tam Lin, which is, you know, a young woman uh, falls in love with, becomes pregnant by a, uh, a human captive of the fairies who on Halloween are going to be sacrificing that man to hell. And it's the heroine's job to grab him, pull him off his horse, and hold him even as the fairy queen turns him through a bunch of different uh, monsters. And the whole point is, if she holds him, she gets to keep him. And that was something that stuck with me. And I'm like, Greta needs that story. Greta needs Greta and Brant Hiller, who becomes Lawrence Herman, uh, need that story very badly. And that's how they get out of Hollywood. Um, there's this... So much of what I know about folklore is just getting away from it. And that just feels kind of perfect for sort of the beauty and the wonder and the trap of things like like fame. You know, it's a lot of a lot of what Lily is dealing with in Hollywood is um, is a trap or a seduction or the illusion of something that you think will make you safe, whether it's beauty or fame or money. And you have to figure out how true that is. And that's a lot of folklore, too. So about that that's yeah that's really yeah. cool it, there's a lot that you know must be out there but there's so i mean every every culture has its own stories and so i love that i i liked the melting pot effect for sure I'm so um, glad. yes very much effective it's all of us trying to keep our kids safe i think is what that comes down to like that's that's what folklore is it's like you know don't go run after fairies don't don't go pick flowers you know don't do this don't do that and maybe you get to stay safe and that's also kind of a lie because a lot of those things that you know our parents weren't about that's not going to keep us safe. So and it's kind know, of we're, we're, we're dealing with that. And then kind of like a modern interpretation, we Hollywood has its own folklore be, in its same way. You hear stories right. about like people always being like, "Oh, you know, be careful when you go out there. Like, don't just sign the first contract or whatever." And like you hear all these horror stories and things. And I noticed that like like reading about Hollywood history, like we talked about, or mentioned the Hollywood Babylon, like how many of those stories were actually made up and stuff and became folklore. So I think that's mm -hmm. cool that it's kind of, Hollywood is very folkloric in that regard, so. We're all just telling each other stories and that's all we've got. That's, you know, that's that's the warning and that's the love and that's the hate and it's all stories all the way down. Yeah, for sure. So as a way to protect and uh, support each other, like the speakeasies, the fake marriages, the sewing circle, the sewing circles, yeah. um, et cetera. Obviously, we've already talked about why those were important back in the day. But do you think that there are support networks like that still today? And why are they still so important for these communities? Absolutely. They're still important today, because at the very least, even when times are good, 
you want to know who is like you and you want, we want to see reflections of ourselves and we want to find allies. We want to find friends. We want to find family. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've been trying to pay attention when I can bear to do so and things are great right now. We need to know who we are and what we can do. And at the very least, it makes us feel less helpless because one of the worst things you can do to anyone is make them feel as if they're helpless and they have no power and there, there's nothing they can do. When we find community, when we find other people like us who want a world where we're allowed to live, we immediately become less helpless. We become, we realize, I mean, first, just the safety in numbers and the power in numbers, but also we have examples of other people doing small things that become great things that will help them, that will help them survive and will help other people survive as well. When someone who is marginalized survives, they are never just surviving for themselves, ever. It's whether it is quiet or whether it is loud, it is a way to show other people how to do it and also a defiance for people who would rather it be otherwise. So that's yeah, what we that's really, yeah. really important uh, for us to discuss um, today. Like we're still in the middle of Pride Month uh, here in Wichita, well, in the United States. In the world? Is Pride Month the world? I think it's U.S. Yeah, I'm not sure. I Don't quote me. Anyway, yeah. um, it's still the middle of Pride Month while we're recording. And so um, I think that's been the big message is just that, you know, it's so important to talk about it, to be examples. Um, so thank you for that answer. <laughs> um, and I have a question. So like with the book... You, when you're writing, you you deal with LGBTQ themes, and then you have themes about racism and misogyny in the book. Um, given the setting of the book, did you feel like that was just going to come up, or did you want to make sure that you address these issues? Like, as a writer, what do you try to do? Like, do you is it just the world we live in that like these issues come up in your writing, or do you do you make it like a priority? I don't really know many straight people anymore. So, I mean, part of it is just the fact of it reflecting the world that I live in, which is, you know, um, it, it feels like, you know, even if you start out with a group of friend of, of straight friends, it's like slowly, if you know them long enough, they just start coming out one after the other. And I'm like, oh, this is a cool thing to have happened around me. Um, for me, it's why it's, I mean, first there's the history, which is, you know, and, and that's history all over. Queer people have always been there. People who aren't white have always been there. Disabled people have always been there. And what it comes down to is, as a writer, why shouldn't I have it? It's me being spoiled and wanting wanting everything. You know, it's more fun to write like this. It is um, it is more truthful to write like this. But once again, I'm a storyteller, and truth is always going to give way in the favor of me doing something very cool on the page. Not going to lie about that. Um, and when it comes right down to depicting queer people on the, on the, um, on the page in general, I, I'm a poor person to, to deliver any kind of message. Uh, I'm not good with themes or with morals. Uh, I can hear my agent already saying, it's like, no, you do have them just unbury them from under all the description you've put on. And I'm like, I don't want to. <laughs> And but I will tell you about something that happened. Um, I'm just going to diverge just a little bit because this is a kind of a hilarious thing that happened to me at uh, Pride earlier this month. Right. I volunteer at the Milwaukee LGBT Center's library. And the coolest thing we do is we actually just give away books that we've donated. So it's really fun to be at Pride and actually just giving something away and not, you know, trying to sell like, you know, a metric ton, ton of plastic rainbow jewelry. Right. And um, so, and one of the things I do is I bring along some of my author's copies and for just suggested donations to the library, people can have them signed or whatever. And I got to talking with this woman whose kid was checking out the books and she said, and uh, we got to talking and I'm like, well, here, how about if I, uh, you know, I just wanted to give her a gift. So I wanted to give her one of my books and she calls her kid over and suddenly her kid grabs one of my books and says, oh my God, I've read this one and it's so great and it's so cool. And her mom's trying to stop her and she's and she just keeps going on and on, which very nice things, thankfully, for all, everyone concerned. And then her mom says, do you know this is the writer? <laughs> and th this kid just says very, she's like, no. Like, it's just like the tiniest, softest, cutest thing. And then I'm like, no, see, that's that's my name. You want, you want to see my ID? This is, this is my picture in the back. You know, and so, I mean, I think that's going to be a weird memory for that kid moving on. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a weird memory for me, but it was very, very sweet. 
And it was just this weird moment of connection. I don't think I could have any idea that the writer was uh, someone she could meet and who was, you know, probably already a little sunburned and probably had some food on her face. Uh, that became real. I think like, I remember what I would have thought of writers when I was a kid and writers weren't real. And for that kid, a writer is real. So there's that. That's, that's so, a wild story. But yeah, it's also I, I really that cute. I love yeah, I think that. I just try to forget all about that because <laughs> I think she, I think that kid like literally booked it away from me after, after, after they got their books. So that was great. It was probably like going to be like a core memory for that kid. They're going to oh, be like, remember that time? Memory. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> um, see, now I can't even do my NPR voice. Oh, because that was a cute story. Okay. So as I wanted to ask you about, um, we, you touched on it a little bit earlier, but like history has not been kind to recording the lives of LGBT folk. I mean, we were looking, some folks were looking here for um, some artifacts or stories uh, in our archives that of just like people existing and we cannot find them because you, it's just not there. Um, so why do you think it's important for historical fiction writers to then tell those stories, highlight those queer characters? First, uh, just uh, because I've done some of this research myself, have you looked in the police reports? That's, yeah, they actually that's what I was going to say. Yeah. That's they one of the did. big ones. I found yeah. so much stuff and I'm like, oh, okay, that's that's uh, that's that's a number of things going on that are very queer right there, which I'm like, police reports, okay. Um, in the Sad, realm of that, true. But very true, yeah, I mean... It doesn't get much cooler than getting run in for uh, for kissing too many girls, not going to lie. <laughs> um, when it comes to writing historical fiction, uh, I mean, I'm a fantasist is part of it. It's I can have whatever I want and I do, which is great. But historical fiction is one more way we see the world. It's one more way we entertain ourselves. And dubiously or not, it's one of the places where we learn about our history. And part of the fun of, his, of, of historical fiction is thinking about what you would have done in their place or who you would have been in, in the Regency, in the Heian era, in World War II, you know, at any other time. And there is this thing that comes when you are marginalized where if you want to play that game, and we all do, starting from when we were kids, we want to play that game. I and mean, some of us never, ever stop playing it ever, which is fun. Um, if you are marginalized and you want to play that game, you end up cutting off bits of yourself. Well, this is who I would be if I was straight, or this is who I would be if I was white, or this is who I would be if I were able-bodied. And that kind of stretching is both good for the imagination and also kind of tragic, you know? why can't, It's like, you know, why can't you be queer on the Titanic? For No one should be on the Titanic. Let's start there. Um, but overall, you know, because there were disabled people, there were queer people, there were people who weren't white everywhere. That is the condition of the world. If you exist now, you existed back then. Maybe you didn't have the words for it. And um, maybe you looked different or you sounded different, but you were still you. And that is a thing that historical fiction at its best offers us. You know, this is you and this is who you might have been back then. And it would have been okay. How about that? Yeah, yeah. no, I think that's perfect. I um, I, We were talking about... Um, they're like writing like with like history and in regards to like what like and what's going on now I, right now the writer's strike is happening mm -hmm. and like there's a dialogue that I keep seeing kind of coming up in news stories about how you're starting to see like more inclusive writing happening but like they're not paying the writers and it kind of reminded me of your book with how like inclusion did exist in these movies but bit roles they were playing housekeepers and like side and do you feel do you have any advice to like writers who are like what like from like inclusive backgrounds that like like just anything motivational because it seems like some of the things that happen it's like they're still dealing with right and so like especially with like not you know like not getting paid is there any advice you'd like to give to like future writers that you know come from various backgrounds and things talk to each other that's the first thing um the important one of the best pieces of advice I ever got as a writer is the people around you are not your competition. Uh, and that's really, really hard to be when 
if you grow up in a place where you get to only be one person, where, you, where you're it, you're the Asian writer, you're the queer writer, and you're the only one. And if you live in that long enough, you start to think you have to be the only one. There's no space for everyone, anyone else. And that's a lie. That is absolutely a lie. The people around you, they're not your competition. They're your friends. They're your colleagues. And they are going to move you forward much faster than you will by trying to get in good with anyone above you. Well, it's nice to be polite, but you know, if you have a job that you can't do, um, have a name ready to suggest to someone else. Not only does that make good, make for good networking, it also breeds a lot of goodwill and um, you need it. You, you definitely need it. And, you know, they talk about writers being mercenary and ambitious. And of course we all are. And you will get further um, with the people who are around you instead of uh, by leaving them behind. How about that? That's really good advice. Um, well, that's, I mean, that's just Great. Thank Great. you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Do you have any upcoming projects that we can look out for? Or um, I think you might have an, a new novella coming out. I think we might have an a advanced reader copy of it that we're oh, going okay. to give away. Um, so stay tuned, listeners. But yeah, share, share what's coming up next for you. Let's see. In September, I have a, uh, a, a Seeing Hills novella coming out, which is about the travels of a non-binary cleric who uh, whose whole job is to tell stories. That's another chi and almost brilliant story. And uh, that one's called Mammoths at the Gates, which I had a very good time writing. I think people are going to really like it. Uh, we just got my schedule set in essentially lightly set into maybe maybe like mortar, not not stone yet. Uh, 2024 so that's very exciting for me which is at least another saying hills novel and i'm not sure not novella i'm not sure i'm gonna talk about the novel yet but it's very in my head it's been called uh 300 years of grief and city planning uh so i'm really looking forward to that one uh beyond that i've sort of just been sort of i've been um sort of like gorging myself on stuff about um about uh, spiritualists from the, like the 1890s and all the fun scams they would do to make people think they were talking with spirits. And one of them was actually uh, stuffing their cheeks with like a pile of cheesecloth that had been soaked in something flammable, right? They just went through the whole seance with a, a piece, a large piece of cheesecloth stuffed in their cheek. And then at a dramatic moment, they would pull it out and light it on fire at the same time. So it looks like, you know, this ghostly phosphorescent thing was floating over this table of horrified morning people. Wow. And I'm like, that is commitment to the bit. You put a flammable piece of cloth in your face and then you lit it like two inches from your nose. And that was just super cool. So that's kind of where I am today. That's oh, I love cool. that. Yeah. I want to read that book. That sounds really cool, right? Yeah, I, I hope I get <laughs> yeah. to read it too. <laughs> Which it's actually, like, if you look at old newspapers, we were, like, a huge hub for spiritualists like, in the day. It's it was of, an industry, right? Yeah. One of the benders was a spiritualist. Oh, wow. that's Wait, cool. the bloody benders? Are you guys talking about the bloody benders? Yeah. yeah. Those, so they're from Kansas. Right, right, right. By the way, hey, yeah. first serial killer family claim to fame. But um, yeah, Kate Bender was, is that her name? Kate? The, the daughter was a spiritualist. So here's a question. Do you guys, do you guys have any beliefs either way on whether Laura Ingalls Wilder's father was involved in the mob that eventually killed Kate Bender? Do you guys have? Oh, I thought he was in a cult. No, I read, Well, I think no. he was in a cult too. He can do both. I, I, all I can tell you is I read like, I followed that rabbit hole once and it was mm -hmm. like, from the Wikipedia page. So like, but I, it said that he did exacerbate a lot of his, like where he was at in history kind of Oh, thing. sure. And that's, that's kind of- That's a hell of a thing to claim. Yeah, that's what I kind of read. That's in that Laura Ingalls Wilder also kind of like made, like added on to stories. So I think like, that's what was the official consensus is like, he did say it, but there's no proof that he did or did not is kind of what I got from that, so. I don't even, My so I read- Sorry, I was just going to say, I read the Hell's Half Acre book that came out last year, and I don't think that he's in it. He was in a, like a lynch mob or a mob that would have like, that's the, what I heard is what. Okay, fair yeah, enough. Yeah. What were you going to say, Nee? Oh, I was just saying my favorite story about Paul Wilder is he might have like run into dire wolves on the prairie. And I'm like, that first, that's a tall tale, but I really like the world where, you know, he was, he ran to like 50 dire wolves while he was riding one day. Did we have dire wolves on the prairie? I know we have wolves. Not as far no. as we know. 
No. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Was well, that I part mean, we of did the story? Like, we okay. did a geological era ago. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. Um, we'll <laughs> definitely be looking out for all of your future projects. Um, thank you yeah. so much for talking with us. This was a really great conversation. Um, loved talking to you. Thank you thank so you much. So it was much. awesome Every meeting time. you. Thank you. Attention, Read ICT super fans. If you're looking for a place to chat about your favorite books, get excellent reading recommendations for challenge categories, or just meet some new friends who love books as much as you do, check out the Read ICT Challenge Facebook group. To join us on Facebook, simply search for groups using hashtag ReadICTChallenge and click join. For more information on the Read ICT Challenge, visit wichitalibrary.org slash readict. Here are some reading recommendations for Category 8, a book featuring an LGBTQ protagonist from our community of readers in the Read ICT Facebook group, and for the first time, voice messages from our readers to our new book review hotline. If you'd like to leave your own review to be featured on a future episode of the podcast, call our book review hotline at 316-261-8507. Leaving a review is easy. After the voice prompt, record your name, location if you're outside Wichita, what Read ICT category your book recommendation is for, title and author of the book, and a brief reason why you recommend it to other readers. If you're looking to connect with other like-minded readers online, be sure to join our Facebook group. After logging into Facebook, search for the group hashtag Read ICT Challenge and click join. You can also find more reading recommendations for this and other categories by visiting wichitalibrary.org forward slash read ICT. White Trash Warlock by David R. Slayton. I tripped across a fantasy series looking for a book that had a color in the title. The first book in the series is White Trash Warlock by David R. Slayton. The main character is also gay, so it could meet the LGBTQIA plus category as well. It was an enjoyable listen, especially if you like magic, magical worlds, and how humans intermix with magical beings. My Policeman by Bethan Roberts. For category number eight, I'm recommending My Policeman by Bethan Roberts. Wonderfully written story, made into a film with Harry Styles, released last year. The Gunkle by Stephen Rowley. A quick, easy read with wonderful life lessons and wonderful humor. The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This book was so good. I love the characters and the plot. It's so interesting and a great inside view of some of the issues of the Gilded Age of Hollywood. I love the character of Evelyn. I didn't expect how Monique was connected to Evelyn and that part wasn't necessarily my favorite. I also love the character of Harry. The Extraordinaries by T.J. Clune. A book that contains fan fiction, real superheroes, and first love. It was a lot of fun. Lie With Me by Philippe Besson, translated by Molly Ringwald. This short book was too good not to recommend. And who knew Molly Ringwald translated French books? Wish I kept track of who recommended books to me so I could thank them. Like a Love Story by Abdi Nazemian. This book would also be perfect for a book about friendship. Taking place in the late 80s when we knew so little about AIDS, it definitely brought back memories of that time. This started as a cute story, but ended as so much more. I loved it. My name is Ashley. I live in Wichita. The title is All of Us Villains by Amanda Foody and C.L. Herman. It has a couple different protagonists, and one of the main ones is LBGTQ. Well, two of them are. I loved it because it is basically everything you wished the Hunger Games had is in this book. It is definitely the Hunger Games a bit darker. And you keep thinking from the synopsis that nobody's going to make it in the end, that they're all going to die off. And it just keeps you guessing up until the last point. It is a duology. Um, so I do suggest both books. But uh, that is my review. Hi, this is Michelle out of Rose Hill, Kansas. I read Catch by Chris Bryant, specifically for Category 8. And I thought it was a nice sports romance story told in a different manner than we normally see. 
uh, it gives light to some of the LGBTQIA plus community and some things that they could go through in their life. Hi, my name is Monica Hosso, and I read an autobiography um, and an LGBTQIA book. It was titled Page Boy by Elliot Page. And it's a beautiful coming of age story of self-realization and self-acceptance. He talks about the highs and lows of his life, his experience growing up in the movie industry, and then his journey of finding his true self. It was definitely a great story to read during Pride Month. Hi, my name is Gina. I'm in Wichita. The category is a book by featuring an LGBTQIA plus protagonist. And um, the book I read was Survivor's Guilt by Robin Cagle. I love the book. It, I love mysteries. And I found this book had an interesting twist with the uh, main character being a transgender woman and that the defendant was a transgender woman. So I just find it fascinating. I and this is my first dip into that world. So um, it was interesting seeing a book that was uh, written about that. So thank you very much. Sarah, and I am in Wichita. The book that I read is The Lesbianist's Guide to Catholic School by Sonora Reyes. And it is a YA book, but it does a really good job of making you care about the characters. And it's a really, I like how the story ended. Thanks. That was a great episode. Oh my gosh. Oh my god. I she it was a really awesome interviewing me. And I'm honestly kind of like want to check out uh, some of her other books like the novella The Empress of Salt and Vinegar. Uh Daniel, I think it's The Salt and Fortune. Oh. All right. I think it's just actually lunchtime and I'm hungry. So Well, yeah. that's fair. Yeah. Let's get out. Let's read the credits and get out of here because I'm starving. <laughs> All right. Credits All right. time. Hey, a list of the books discussed in today's episode can be found in the accompanying show notes. To request any of the books heard about in today's episode, visit wichitalibrary.org or call us at 316-261-8500. A big thanks to Nevo for joining us for today's recording. We'd also like to thank those who shared recommendations for Category 8. This has been a production of the Wichita Public Library. And a big thank you goes out to our production crew and podcast team. To participate in the Read ICT Reading Challenge, please visit wichitalibrary.org slash readict. Stay connected with other Read ICT participants on the Read ICT Challenge Facebook page. Find out what's trending near you, post book reviews, look for local and virtual events, and share book humor with like-minded folks. To join the group, search hashtag Read ICT Challenge on Facebook and click join. And don't forget to log your books in the Reading Tracker at Beanstack. Each month, you log a book into the challenge you're eligible to win fun prizes. If you need any assistance signing up or logging books, give us a call. Reach us on chat or stop by your nearest branch. You can follow this podcast through Spotify or stream episodes wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you heard today, hit subscribe and share with all your friends. See you next time. Bye. I'm just really hungry.